I'm a DJ boy, going to decentral, making NFT, I'm a DeFi being crypto poor but Jay Let me introduce our next panel covering the metaverse and how maybe, just maybe, it can be better than what we have right now. So please join me in welcoming to the stage our moderator, who will introduce the other speakers on the panel, Miss Anastasia. Hello, Texas. Well, in my metaverse, I wake up around 11 a.m., but okay. Um, my name is Anastasia Drinevskaya. I am creative director at Cointelegraph and chief executive officer at Cointelegraph Communications. And today we are going to talk about the metaverse and how it possibly could rebuild society, but better. And I have the most amazing speakers today. How lucky am I? So um, I'm always scared to mix up the names, so I will read a bit. So Robert Grant, founder and chief executive officer of Crown Sterling. Please applause. Preston Wu, CFO of Taffy and Das 3D. Ariel Abellino, Chief uh, Marketing Officer and Executive Producer for Strange Clan and 3D Vision. And William Idrisi, also well known as uh, like William Bear, Founder Nivers Work. So, Guys, uh, the first thing we are going to talk right now is your experience, of course. So could you please share it with us a bit in a nutshell? So, Robert. Sure. Sure. So I've, uh, I spent most of my career in the healthcare field, but I've always been into mathematics. And uh, while I was in healthcare, I launched products like Botox and Juvederm. I was president of Allergan, which is a big pharmaceutical company, and then became CEO of Bausch & Lomb Surgical and did intraocular lenses and things like that. But um, in the last 10 years, I've been very much into math and written a book called Philomath on mathematics and particularly associated as well with cryptography. And so um, that's what I do. I'm the CEO of uh, Crown Sterling. Cool. So, Preston? Sure. So I'm, I'm Preston Wu. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer and Chief Financial Officer of Taffy and Daz 3D. Um, I started my career in investment banking, but... Um, after that, after doing like an analyst stint and thinking that was kind of boring, I went into tech and did, have been doing tech for the last 20 years. Most recently, I joined Taffy and Daz about a year and a half ago. Um, we do avatars, interoperable content, and we moved into NFTs, which has been fantastic. My name is Ariel Abelino, which Anastasia told you guys. Um, my past has both, mostly been in um, marketing. I've been marketing things from films um, and uh, Kickstarter launches um, and then uh, got into e-commerce for a while and with Passage you know, um, we did a lot of uh, 3D development and worked with a uh, 3D team and that kind of turned into uh, us looking at what do especially when it came to uh, when, when we got into 2020 and uh, uh, virtual events started to become more and more um, a question of far, as far as how do we have people actually meet together in a space, um, but have it feel way more real, um, that question started to become one that we were really interested in answering. So um, uh, that's where kind of we've come with Passage and uh, kind of introducing that into uh, the conversation of Metaverse has been amazing. Um, hey, yeah, so I'm William Bear. I was a full stack software engineer that I uh, really enjoyed uh, coding and building new things and solving problems. Uh, I quickly started my own uh, dev shop in San Francisco. And a lot of our clients started asking about uh, blockchain and metaverse technologies to be deployed for them. And when our clients were doing really well, we decided to start building some of these products and features for our own things. So we reached out first to Near Protocol and we built the Nearverse.org uh, with them. 
and um, it's a full-on metaverse uh, that has gates to Minecraft, has portals into a Unity-style metaverse, and all of those things. And now we're also going to be working with Harmony. We're building out the Blueverse with them, and we're in talks with some other layer ones. And that's kind of our go-to-market is to apply the metaverse technologies that we have from the video game industry to uh, these layer one blockchains in a way that it can showcase their whole ecosystem really well. Thank you, guys. So, as you can see, we have a perfect team to discuss. And uh, the first question is, what is the metaverse? Like, in my opinion, there is two ways to explain this. And first one is digitalization of our lives. And this means that we already in the metaverse. We have cell phones, we have internet, Apple watches, and all this stuff. And the second way is if we are connected to computers, uh, like, and uh, we are trying to live our separate second or third or fourth life. So, what is metaverse for you? How you understand this? I think uh, you know, could make an argument that we're probably living in a metaverse. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm not actually joking in a way because you know the entire universe around us is writ with mathematics, and all of it is based on right triangles. And that's exactly what metaverses are built upon as well. And I think that, you know, I do a lot of work. I also teach at Northwestern Business School in the Executive MBA program. And I think the biggest challenge a lot of leaders face is knowing themselves. So you can imagine creation of metaverses in a way to help us to learn and become self-aware of who we are the different aspects of self. You could even apply this concept to different timelines and different histories and be able to imagine that the world we live in might actually be a simulation. So when we think of it in those terms, the metaverse becomes very exciting because it's like that moment when the AI becomes sentient. When we start to transcend ourselves and understand that we're in sort of a game and, and the context of the world being around us like a metaverse and then we're creating new metaverses actually is just sort of like a fractal self-similar replication of the same concepts. It's just a different way of looking at it. I saw a, a, a very interesting video with Keanu Reeves lately and um, you know, after the latest installment of The Matrix, the last one, and he said he was talking with this woman and this woman was saying, you know, why did you want to do The Matrix? He said, well, because I really strongly believe that there's a difference between reality and illusion. And she said, why does it matter? And he said, well, because I want to know the truth. And she said, but if it's indistinguishable from reality, if the illusion is that real, then why does it matter? And she asked that question three times until he finally said, okay, I get it. Well, I'm not sure that we are real anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Preston? So I, I, I definitely think uh, there's a good chance we live in a simulation because I, I see things breaking all the time in, in, this, in this world. But the last um, two years have said that exactly, too, hasn't it? Exactly. So, um, from, from my perspective, my company, we do avatars and digital identity across different um, games and apps. So, if you think of like avatars in Zoom, if you think of avatars in Unreal or in Unity or even on your uh, mobile devices, we do that. So, in my mind, it's not about one metaverse. I think we're in many different metaverses and I think we interact in it in different ways depending on the context. Um, there's a lot more I can go on that, but I'll, I'll hand it over to my illustrious peers. Oh, thank you, man. I really appreciate that. <laughs> this guy's my swole great. peers. He, this guy's great at giving compliments. I love this. Totally. Um, so I agree with that, and I, I love the idea that, one, we start talking about more than one metaverse, because I think that there's a problem with uh, trying to say, hey, we're going to pick the winner. This is the person who, or this is the metaverse that we think is going to be the metaverse. I think that's the wrong conversation to have. I think that kind of like what you're saying is, is that we're looking for an extension of the physical world, you know, into this digital world. So I think that one of the most interesting things about the conversation around the metaverse is what is this going to look like for how we look at ownership digitally? Because everything that we've done over the last, you know, essentially going into the internet has been this evolution of us trying to uh, productize, you know, digital uh, uh, items. 
And so when you look at your Audible account, you know, you think in your mind that you own each of those books that are in your Audible account. But do you? Because you can't give them to a friend like you can your physical book. You can't sell them if you wanted to. Um, you can't destroy them if you wanted to. So the question is, is you know, do you actually own that or does Audible own that and then they just let you have access to it sometimes? And in which reality exactly you have this access? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think the conversation is really interesting around what do you own and how do we take the physical benefits of ownership um, and start to translate them into you know, the metaverse and into you know, uh, uh, the digital objects that we're kind of building right now. Yeah, when it, when it comes to empowering communities, especially in the digital form, I think metaverses is a great medium to do so. Um, I think, honestly, one of the first things that's going to occur with metaverses is going to take a lot of the communication that we have to do in our daily lives um, through the metaverse. And that will open us up to work from home and be with our families more because you'll be able to debrief your boss in the metaverse. It will help us be able to travel more because we'll be a more nomadic lifestyle because of that. And I think that's probably going to be the first foyer. And then after that, it's going to evolve and grow even more and more into the inter entertainment side and all these other benefits that it can add to the users. Um, I think digital communities being connected uh, through the medium of the net metaverse is very exciting because it gets their attention. And then I think with blockchain, we can make those connections legitimate through the use cases of smart contracts. And when people are able to be organized on that level, the same level as the largest Fortune 500 companies, right? When your Reddit groups are now that organized because of the smart contracts that they have, I'd be really excited to see the types of goals that they want to accomplish and the skills that they use and deploy to get there. Well, and if we are talking about how to how metaverse could rebuild society. Uh, the next question will be like, you care about Metaverse, I care about Metaverse. Why should anyone else care about Metaverse? How to make Metaverse more accessible for other people? Your opinion, William. So I think that a lot of people are going to care about the Metaverse because of uh, three things my dad told me. When starting a company or trying to get a new vision out, you need to be able to get people's attention, conversation, and then agreement, right? Agreement's the greatest thing that humans have to give. They can agree that your currency is legitimate, that your flag is real, that your company is valuable, all of these different things. And I think that the metaverse will be a very easy way to get people's attention. It's very colorful, it's very bright. We can put a lot of different bells and whistles into this. And then that can lead to a medium in which people can have a conversation that ultimately the blockchain can lock them in with some agreement. Right? And um, I think that the first movers there are going to form agreements that help power their vision to the next level. And everyone else is going to see that, get some FOMO, and they're going to come rushing in. So um, I honestly think it's going to be an exciting shift into the digital foyer being a part of our communities, but not necessarily replacing all of our communities in society. Errol? Yeah, so I think it's been interesting to see how much adoption has happened with NFTs and gaming, and there's a, a lot of interest from people who aren't very technically minded. And when DeFi became a thing, um, you had a lot of people who were more technically minded and you had you know, the financially minded crowd, but you still had a relatively niche crowd. Then you had this massive wave of people come in because it was something that they could reach for and understand. So I think that when we kind of transition from just building infrastructure, which is what a lot of the um, attention has been spent on um, and start moving towards um, actually building like consumer facing products. And you were talking about virtual work. Um, I think that um, when we look at the metaverse, we really haven't talked about what the use cases are um, in, in very much detail. That's certainly not been the headliner of the conversation, but Zoom was the headliner of the conversation in 2020. And so I think that the metaverse is kind of like, um, a rational answer to that, or a rational follow-up, I should say, to that conversation. You know, we saw a lot of benefits from being able to work remotely from each other. So now the question is, well, 
is there a way that we can somehow bridge the gap between the benefits that we saw with the physical interactions and the benefits that we saw in this more digital, um, you know, flexible space? So I think that starting to answer real human problems like, you know, remote work and the very global situation that we have right now, I think that's what's going to hook it. Sure. So um, the question was uh, how to make the metaverse more accessible. And to me, like where I stand right now, that question's almost like, how do we make oxygen more accessible? It's like, we're living in it right now. I mean, with the pandemic and with Zoom coming on board, like, you know, one of the benefits, I mean, it was a, you know, bad experience overall, but one of the benefits of the pandemic is accelerated our entrance into the metaverse by probably like 10 years. So we do have the remote work. The number one use of internet is gaming, where that whole generation of um, the, that gaming culture and that generation, they're used to buying digital goods, interacting in that level of metaverse. And the next stage, I think, just to um, the points that have been talked about before, is just making it more consumer facing, which I think a large majority of us in this conference right now are in the process of building. So super excited. I think we're in the process of making it super accessible. I see it as two different aspects that are somewhat related, but first and foremost, it's going to come down to this trend that we've seen in the beginning of, of the whole blockchain field and industry it was all about proof of work. It really started out on proof of work. And then it went to proof of stake. And that's kind of the zone we're in now, but we're now transitioning to a whole new era, which is going to be about proof of self. You know, I have four fake Telegram accounts right now. <laughs> Drives me insane. The last one decided to change the last letter of my name, right? And then blocked me so I can't even see it. You have to check twice. But you have to check many <laughs> times, right? So I think the next big issue that's going to be an impediment to people adopting Metaverse is we need to be able to protect, protect our identity and ourselves. Our digital lives are an extension of our actual lives. Right? And so we need to be able to have data sovereignty. I mean, true data sovereignty. And the way that that's going to be accomplished is going to be through innovative quantum resistant cryptography, uh, which is what we do. Uh, we make, we're a layer one blockchain uh, that utilizes quantum resistant cryptography called one time pad. And we've innovated that. And secondly, I think the thing that's going to make it very accessible and why it's going to be super attractive is going to be that you can create a world that is truly indistinguishable from reality. And I don't think we're that far away from that. And one of the companies that, that I have in, in, in our portfolio is called Cyber. And Cyber is an intraocular lens that does everything that your iPhone does, but it's implanted inside your eye. Everything your iPhone does implanted inside your eye. It's a really crazy cool technology for augmented reality, for virtual reality. And it will be able, it has a camera embedded within it too. It, it can actually record your life. So your memories, all of your experiences could be passed on to your children or even to your next substrate, biological substrate, if you decide you want to clone yourself or something. But none of that's going to be possible unless we can actually achieve this issue of true reality, making it truly indistinguishable from reality so that those experiences also could be NFT'd. You know, maybe I want to live Ashton Kutcher's life and if I'm going to go into a virtual world, it truly needs to be incredibly indistinguishable from reality. So the way that that's going to have to happen is going to be without putting too much burden on energy, right, within the world. 20% of the world's energy today is already going to data storage. The way I think that's going to be made possible, in addition to cryptography that is rock solid and you can protect yourself, is going to be compression, mathematical compression. And so that's the substrate upon which I think the metaverses will eventually be built. Where can we get the highest level of efficiency, the highest degree of compression ratio? And I'm not talking about lossy. I'm talking about true lossless compression that's mathematical. And that's, that's what we do. We're innovating in both of those areas so we can work with companies like all the other ones here on this panel, uh, both cryptographically uh, with one-time pad encryption. We already have a mathematical compression for the keys. And then secondly, with their compressions to make those, help make them create worlds that are indistinguishable from reality. You know what? You literally took my next question and answered it. Okay. <laughs> well, but like, 
if just imagine we already in metaverse uh, everyone already adopted uh, and we are trying to secure uh, users identity should we have the same identity or we can have a million others identity and how we can prove this and should we and in this aspect could metaverse be dangerous Preston sure so if the question is should we have one identity or many identities yeah, like there, there are several questions in yeah. one like so I'll, I'll address that one so my company yeah we do uh, avatars and virtual identity and we see three types of uh, avatars that people create one it is the one just like yourself like hey that's the one I want to project in a professional manner it looks kind of like me um, the second type of avatar is uh, what you think your real self is so if you happen to be um, potentially uh, constrained by a, a physical limitation uh, you are um, you don't perceive yourself as like physically appear in a certain way, um, we see people do that. And so they're like, hey, this is how I view myself in, you know, maybe, I, maybe I'm diminutive, maybe I'm uh, shorter, and I, I view myself as like a six foot four like basketball player. Um, that's how we see some people project themselves. And the third, uh, which I just want to say, like, and this is relevant to the metaverse, um, it's like some, let's not be constrained by uh, reality. Let's have some creativity and imagination. This is when it gets pretty interesting and people create fantastical, uh, you know, virtual identities for themselves. And that's, um, that's where I think uh, uh, the metaverse is heading. I think that uh, when we talk about the metaverse not being indistinguishable, I also want to think of, hey, let's, let's get out there and let's be creative with our lives and let's, uh, let's do something pretty interesting. So those are the, you know, think beyond ogres or, um, you know, the, the different characters that we wish we could be. And so I think um, there's a couple elements to that question, but uh, I think we should uh, have the avatar that we want to have, uh, depending on on what we're doing. Don't don't hit on ogres. Just, yeah. <laughs> First thing that popped in. By the way, head. I'm the six foot six basketball player. Exactly. Mm, that sounds just like me too. Yeah. <laughs> should I? So yes, of course. All right, because I really like I really like that that answer. Um, because one of the things I hear Robert and Preston saying is that one, identity is incredibly important when you start to say, how does my present identity translate into the digital? Um, I, I, one of the things I see is the, the need for choice for what you are exposing. So I think that ultimately you need to have something that is uh, like, this is the, like let's say it's the, the NFT that holds the identity and, and all of the different forms of that identity. But you should be able to expose you know, what element of it you want, where you want. Because we're not saying it's one metaverse, we are saying it's many metaverses. It's a, and perhaps they're unified and interoperable with each other. We're built in Cosmos, so that's really important. All my Cosmos people are like, yeah. So, <laughs> there we go. So, um, the, uh, being able to decide what you show in uh, whatever context you're in is incredibly important and have the ability to be able to pull that back. Right now, we do have people expressing themselves differently um, on the internet, but the second they've expressed something, it can't take it back. The second it's out there, you can't take it back. And so having the ability to be able to, and I'm sure the secret network guys are like, yes, this is awesome. Because uh, that's 100% the, the avenue where if you have the ability to uh, show something, you should also have the ability to truly own the information that you're showing and be able to pull it back as you want. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, I think identities in the metaverse um, is going to be amazing. I love the idea that we can have multiple usernames on Twitter and like have different kinds of feeds for different kinds of niches. I also want to say this from like a real perspective, being a minority in America, being able to have like a pseudonym or an anonymous kind of presence where my ideas are the only thing that's judged, right, is kind of refreshing of a way to have a community. Um, but ultimately, I think that money is the API for humans. And I think that um, the same way that Web3 has identities tied to your wallet, the money that you have and the history of her actions will be your identity, 
right? So when you have a NFT or when you have a wallet that's connected to your avatar, people will be able to see, oh, he bought the RFKT clone early on, or he was able to get a really cool dress X fashion uh, thing on it. And that's going to be like, I think it's going to be a switch from right now where we're worried about being exploited by our data to where we're proud of our data and we want to show what our wallet did before your wallet did, right? Like, and all of these things. And I think, um, and I think, yeah, there's going to be, on the flip side, a lot of scams, a lot of people impersonating other people. I definitely have impersonators online. Uh, please hear my voice before engaging in any business. But um, I think that's okay. The internet's a big place, and people get smarter, and we're going to have to combat alongside these tools that are helping us. Well, guys. Um as you can see, in a good company, time really flew. And I see that our virtual bomb will explode it in one minute and a half. So the last question, uh, if you, in a nutshell, can give an advice for a next generation about the metaverse, what it would be? I would say let's make sure we build it as efficiently as we possibly can so that it doesn't have to take too many resources here on our planet of our real metaverse, if there's such a thing as a real metaverse. And, and I, I think we need to have mechanisms economically within these structures as well. I like this idea of the API for humans as being money. But I also believe that if we can protect our experiences, our memories, all of our data in a way like a quantum VPN, like is what we also make, basically you can encrypt all of it so that the other companies can't access it. And data is already the most valuable asset in the world. And I believe it's the first mechanism as a possible chance of having a universal basic income. And if we can build that into metaverses as a concept as well, that would be pretty cool. I will take your advice. Okay. <laughs> Preston? Uh, I think there's like five seconds. So I'll just say like, less, less, less FUD and let's fucking go. <laughs> Woo! Go for our day. It's hard to follow up both of those. Well, that was really good. Um, I would say focus on making real products because I think that if we're just trying to be out there and make a bunch of different things that we think are hyped, don't do that. Make real products um, and actually focus on who is that end user going to be for the product because at that point you are actually making something real versus just making something that is um, because everybody else is making it. I know when you guys see all the entrepreneurs in the space, it's a little bit overwhelming. You think that other people are building something more complex than what you can get involved with. But I would say in a world where robots are trying to, be, to take on more human responsibilities, try to be even more human. Right? Try to be as creative, as artistic, as uniquely thinking as you can, because that's going to be further down the line before robots will be able to emulate that. And I think that's a little future focused. Um, thank you. Thank you, guys. You are incredible because you are trying to change the world. Thank you, and thank you the, for the audience who came to listen to us. Thank you. We are finished. Thank you. Thank you.